Welcome back, everybody, to the Club Metaverse podcast. I'm Mark Fernandez, and I'm joined here by the great, the one and only Mr. Alan Ball, Academy Award winner for American Beauty, creator of Six Feet Under, True Blood, Banshee, um, Here and Now, or is it Here and There? I'm so, sorry. Here and Now. Here and Now. I had it right the first time. Yeah. Um, um, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How's um how's the uh, new year been treating you so far? Uh <clears throat> so far so good. I got uh I got sick and I thought it was covid, but it wasn't. It was just a bad cold. Right. Um, which was I I was it, it was a little bit of a letdown. I was like, <laughs> you know. Right. Cuz you're hoping you're like, to get those antibodies. I know, exactly. <laughs> and uh but I'm but I'm better now and um you know just just living in this crazy world that is uh, every day seems more and more like a, a, a bad science fiction movie. Does, does that, to that point, is this, you know, somebody with the type of creative history that you have, and I can only assume the creative mind that you have, is there, is there been some new musings going on that are a reflection of this era? Because your work has always been such an incredible reflection of the time that it was made. You know, I think back to American Beauty and what that movie meant to me at the time. And of course, I want to go into American Beauty with you. And then, of course, Six Feet Under and what Six Feet Under meant to me at the time when it was coming out. And then True Blood, which was this like old gothic tale, like told in the, you know, in the early aughts. You know, it's like you're, you're, you're very sharp at making reflections of the culture that you see around you. Have you been inspired to do anything with what's been going on today, or is it a little bit dead for creativity with this kind of stuff? Uh, I wrote a couple of things. Uh, they weren't specifically about COVID. One was a horror movie. One was a pilot, but uh, they weren't. Um, they they didn't really go anywhere. Uh, I don't find myself inspired by what's going on. I feel like mm -hmm. I'm I'm one of the you know I I mean I think the entire world is is kind of in the middle of an anxiety attack and and depressed and I'm I'm one of those people too. I have to uh, I have to really um, use my brain and not surrender to um, the emotions that I'm having these days because a lot sure. of them are. You know, aside from COVID, just watching America disintegrate and watching these fascists yeah. take over and, and nobody seems to be able to stop them. And it's super depressing. And the lack of dialogue around these issues as well, you know, yeah. like, like the lack of communication, because I can oppose somebody's opinion and they can oppose mine. But it just seems like even the option for dialogue is not available these days as it once was. Even if before the outcome will still be violence or something negative, it just seems like even the opportunity for hearing somebody else's opinion is kind of even the even the thought of listening is considered potentially quote unquote problematic. Yeah, it's it's a tough period in time that we're living in for sure. Yeah, yeah. So can I? Um, I have to ask before I start digging into your incredible history as a as an artist. Um, is there any kind of high concept little uh, tease you can give me around the horror that you were working on? Uh, I, you know, I wrote this screenplay on spec. <clears throat> it was about a bunch of privileged frat boys who go on a ski trip and somebody starts killing them one by one. It's a slasher <laughs> movie. Um, and, uh, the, you know, and that's uh, the, the big question is who's doing it and why. Right, right. I love um, that. But uh, uh, people did not go for it. People did not go for it. Was it was it kind of like a like in a dark comedy type of take? Like, well, it was very dark. Um, they, uh, it was, it was. Um, I mean, I don't think this movie will ever get made. So I can, I can, I can, I can give it a. You know, I can give you some spoilers. It turns yeah. out that the killer is a woman. Okay. Uh, who was, uh, you know, um, gang raped by these guys. Oh, boy. And I just ran into a lot of, uh, a lot of resistance because it was, uh, a lot of people thought that a man should not write that script. Right, right. 
I mean, maybe they should look at your body of work and, and you know, <laughs> you're, you're the, uh, you know, you're the man, person, whatever you want to call yourself that has like kind of redefined what people think of as, as acceptable. And, you know, I, um, anyway, I'm a huge fan of yours. I, I, once again, I want to thank you for being on the show. I want to thank you also for the amount of hours and tears that you've brought to my face. Um, <laughs> la last yes. night, last night I actually, because, you know, getting kind of prepped up for this interview, I, I, I rewatched the pilot of six feet under for the first time in maybe 10, 15 years. Wow. And like, I was crying like a little baby again, you know, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's such incredible work. Um, and I'm so grateful to you for it. But before we get to six feet under, I definitely want to talk to you about what I believe is a perfect movie. You know, to me, I don't give that, you know, accolade out lightly. I think there's only been a few off mm -hmm. the top of my head. I consider cries and whispers by Igmar Bergman, a perfect movie. I consider The Matrix by the by the Wachowskis a perfect movie. I think Back to the Future is a perfect movie. And I think Silence of the Lambs is a perfect movie. And I think American Beauty is a perfect movie. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit about that process of how that movie kind of, you know, came about. I I know that um, you, you had um, a spoken once in an interview that um, – there was a, a a case in New York um, about a a older man and a younger woman that was very controversial back in the day. I forget the names of them exactly, but that somehow that image that you saw in a comic book gave you that kind of Lolita style inspiration for for the world that you built in American Beauty. But in any case, I'd love to hear a little bit from you about that. Yeah, there was uh, <clears throat> when I was living in New York, there was a big. Um... There was a, a big scandal uh, involving this man. I think he, I think he lived on Long Island. His name was Joey Botafuco, and uh, and this teenage girl named Amy Fisher. Mm. And I can't remember. And his wife. There was a maybe there was a some sort of plot to shoot the wife or something. She, but it, which never happened. But they got arrested, and it was a big sensational tabloid thing and they were selling comic books uh out in front of the building i worked uh in and one one side showed like joey Botafuco is like this buttoned up nice suburban husband and amy was all tarted up and lolita and flirting with him and you turned it over and on the other side there was uh you know, Catholic schoolgirl virginal Amy and Joey Buttafuoco was this leering guy and a wife beater and a big belly and and I remember thinking, we'll never know what really happened. Sure. Uh, it's somewhere in between there, you know. Right. And I remember thinking that's an interesting story. And then, but then I uh, I, I didn't really do much. Uh, I tried to write it as a play, and it it didn't go anywhere. So I just I just gave it up. And then after I moved to L.A. and started working in sitcoms, um, I was wor I, I was working on shows that I really didn't like and I didn't like the process. And and um, it just wasn't it just felt like factory work. Mm. And I, I wanted to to leave the show I was working on and take a year off and write uh, the great American screenplay or my version of it. Wow, I just got chills because you indeed did do that, sir. <laughs> and they uh, they offered me so much money to stay that I thought, okay, well, I'll just bank it, and and then I'll and then after this year, I'll I'll write the screenplay. But what happened is I felt like such a whore, mm. um, and I was so angry with myself with the work that I was doing that I would come home from work and I would just pour my frustration and anger and uh, and need to write about something that mattered, wow. uh, even if only to me, into this screenplay, which ended up being American Beauty. Um, so, so that's what happened. That's amazing. And, and how did you... Um... Because I know that um, you spoke. First of all, there's a there's a story that I've been meaning to ask you, and, and I've 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 um, been thinking about this, you know, while and, and like I visualized my own answer to it for years. But 
um, kind of skipping ahead here, during the Oscars, when you accepted the Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay for American Beauty, you said that there was a moment in front of the World Trade Center um, where you saw the bag that famously became, you know, that scene where there's sometimes there's so much beauty in the world that, you know, like, I don't know what to do with myself, mm -hmm. that you actually had a story of the bag in front of the World Trade Center. I I've been waiting a long time to ask you about that. What, what, what actually happened there? Um, I had gone, I lived in Brooklyn and I had gone into Manhattan to meet some friends for brunch. It was Sunday. And I just, it was a, it was kind of an interesting day. It was overcast, but it wasn't too cold. And I thought, well, I'm just going to walk uh, for a while. And I was uh, walking through the, uh, the courtyard in front of the, the two, the twin towers mm. of the World Trade Center. And there was a plastic bag blowing uh, around in the wind and it, it, um, it blew in a circle around me. Uh, wow. many times. Uh, so uh, enough that it felt like this is weird. Right. What is going on? And I felt like I was in the presence of something. I don't know what, you know, but right. uh, it, and maybe that's just all manufactured in my head. You know, it, I, it doesn't really matter if that's the case. Um, and it was a it was a really interesting, profound, incredibly quiet um, uh, moment, and there was nobody else there. It was just me. Um, so then, you know, cut to years later when I'm writing the screenplay and I'm typing, and Ricky says, "You want to see the most beautiful thing I ever filmed?" And she says, "Sure." And I thought, "Okay, well, what is that going to be?" Right. Um, and I thought, you know. I thought it was that plastic bag. Right. So For me. You pulled, right. You pulled from your own experiences, which it seems like if you look at your body of work, there seems to be a lot of Alan Ball in your work, which is everybody always says, write what you know, write what you know. But it, it really does seem that you've been very successful in taking yourself and sprinkling yourself across not a single character, but multiple characters. You know, yeah. like if you look at, David and, and Nathaniel in Six Feet Under, like, I can only imagine that there's a lot of you in both of them, you know, that it's not exclusive to one or the other. Um, and and in Six Feet Under, I'm sorry, in, a, in American Beauty, I can only imagine that there's some frustration in you in the main character, that there's frustration in, of you in the wife, in Rick, and, and that you're able to successfully sprinkle yourself across your different characters. In your writing process, do you put yourself in all of the characters or are you cognizant that everybody's kind of different and it's pretty much like there's a protagonist with antagonists around them? I think uh, I probably put myself in all the characters. I spent a lot of time when I was younger wanting to be an actor. Mm. And I, you know, I did a lot of acting in college and uh, some once I got out of school. Um, so what, what I, what I think happened is I got used to feeling personally invested in characters. Mm. Um, and so when I write, I tend to try to get in their skin and be in, you know, in their minds and, and sort of not, and figure out what makes them tick and not, not, you know, not just write cardboard villains and heroes sure. um, because that's just, to me, that's not very interesting. Um, I think I'm, I'm fascinated by psychology. I'm fascinated by human behavior. And, and so I do find myself, uh, I, I mean, I, I say the lines out loud as I'm, as I'm writing, I, right. I, I sort of play the role in my head and then I put my own personal performance uh, choices in there as stage directions. And then later I have to go and take those out. Um, well, but it's, it's a very, it's a very, or certainly for me, characters and, and discovering the character and, and, and writing the character and being the character when you're writing the character is, is a very organic process. It might be a subtle form of madness, 
Um, <laughs> but it's the only way I know how to do things. Um, so for my younger listeners out there, um, I'm, I'm about to get into some spoilers. And if you haven't seen the work of Alan Ball, if you haven't seen American Beauty, you know, switch off and go watch that movie because I'm going to get into what I think is one of the strongest endings in cinematic history. Um, the, you know, what happens to Lester is it, there's, there's two endings in movies that every time I know it's going to happen, I still can't deal with it. And that, you know, one of them is American Beauty and what happens to Lester at the end. And the other one is, you know, you're going to laugh at me, but it's Revenge of the Sith and seeing Anakin make the bad choice and becoming the Darth Vader gets me every time. I think George Lucas did a great job with that. Um, is Lester Burnham the most like Alan Ball? Like what, what, when you wrote that character was because like, now that you mentioned the frustrations with the sitcom writer, I can see the frustrations with his day job and that incredible scene where he has that moment where he, you know, threatens his boss with the potential, you know, sexual misconduct and all that stuff. Um, what was that the most Alan Ball esque at the time that you were able to sort of put down on the page? I think probably it was, given that I, you know, it's no um, coincidence that uh, Lester is a writer. You know, granted, he writes for a, 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 a trade magazine, but he's a writer who has lost his passion for life. Mm. And, um, I was at that time a writer who had lost my passion for my work. Mm. Uh, and so I think I was able to sort of mine that um, experience that I was going through and, and pour it into him. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't other characters in the movie that I, that I also feel invested in. But uh, I, would, I would certainly say that I had a real organic connection to his frustration and his need to break out of what had become a very sterile um, existence. And, and and just for my own personal trivia, because like, you know, again, this is such an incredible script. Who was the first person who read American Beauty aside from yourself? My agent. Your agent read it. Who, 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 who you've been very nice to through the years saying that, he was the one that told you, it seems like this is the story you're the most passionate about. This is what you should work on, which yeah. is, you know, very, very good advice. Um, he was the first person who read it. What, what, what was his kind of feedback to you when he, when he read this, you know, the great American screenplay? He was very complimentary. He said, this is really something special. Um, if, if it's okay with you, I would like to start talking this up. Mm. But what he was very smart, what he did is he started talking, at least as I understand it, he started talking to uh, people in the industry saying, I have this client, he just wrote the most amazing script. <laughs> and they'd say, well, can I read it? And he'd say, no, you're not on the list. Mm. So it was a very curated list of people that it went to. Wow. Um, and uh, And then the night before... I had had some meetings with some, some, you know, a lot of people passed, uh, mm -hmm. it's not for everybody. Um, but I had had some meetings and I had, had a meeting with a smaller company and then I was ready to go with them. And then Andrew called me, he said, hold on, Steven Spielberg's reading this script tonight. Wow. And I thought, well, he'll hate it. It's not going to, it's certainly not something that steven spielberg <laughs> will like right right especially with the dream work stuff which eventually obviously that's who made the movie but you know yeah, yeah no that, that yeah and and so i thought okay well let him read it and then we'll figure and and then um uh and then he called the next day and he said he wants to meet you and um dan jinx and bruce cohen were the producers who had taken it into dreamworks or, or amblin or whatever it was at the time um, and, uh, I went over there and had a meeting and then, uh, I, we were standing by the car and, uh, Steven Spielberg is w walking towards us. And I thought, <laughs> oh, I'm about to meet Steven Spielberg. Okay. Just act like this is normal. <laughs> and, um, and he said, uh, he said, why haven't I heard of you? And I said, I don't know. I've been working in TV. 
and he said, well, you should, uh, you should be working in movies and you, you should write movies and you should write your own movies. Mm. Um, which was a really wonderful thing to hear from, you know, a great filmmaker like him. Did did you have a relationship with Sam Mendes prior to this, or was Sam Mendes sort of packaged with you and you met him as a result of this project? I met him as a result uh, of this project. I had heard of him, um, and they were pitching a lot, they were pitching a lot of A list directors and people who who had ideas about what the movie should be and really terrible casting. And um, then I knew I, Steven was interested in working with Sam because Sam had just directed this sort of reimagined version of the musical Cabaret. Um, sure, sure. And so I went to see it in New York and I was really impressed in that it was very creative and very, um, uh, interesting, but all in service of the script. Mm. Um, a lot of times directors will read a script and they'll, they'll go, oh, well, this reminds me of this thing, so let's make a movie about this thing. Sure. Um, and so I met Sam. I, I said, I, I, would, I think this guy is the right guy. I met him, and, uh, and he was. And, uh, and, you know, I, one of the reasons I, when I went with... Um, DreamWorks, as opposed to the other place that that had made the offer, I um, I said one of the conditions for me is I want I want to be on set. Mm. I want to. I've I've never been on a movie set. I've only been on four camera sitcom sets. Um, I would like to be a part. I would like to be there and sort of watch, um, which ended up being kind of like film school for me, right? Um, and uh, Sam was very collaborative and uh, he, I remember um, he came over to my house and he asked me to read the script aloud to him. The it's whole thing, playing every character. Playing every character. Cause he just wanted to hear how I heard the, the lines in my head. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, which I thought was really smart. Uh, I mean, he's very, very smart. Oh man, he's a, you know. 1917 yeah. was is a mind blowing picture. <laughs> yeah, he's 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 a genius. Yeah. Um and so working with him, you know, I was able to I didn't I did I wasn't intrusive uh because most everything that was going on was I could I could tell was working and was great. There were a couple of times I would step in and say for example, Wes Bentley was saying wasn't saying the line sometimes there's so much beauty in the world that I feel I can't I can't take it I feel like it's my heart is just going to cave in right he's paraphrasing it and it just wasn't right right and I said that line needs to be verbatim right 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 good call sir good call <laughs> there are, pl you know, there are yeah. plenty, of, plenty of other times where actors improvise or they or they sort of you know make the line their own that uh, I was fine with because it it, it was it worked you know, one one last thing. I don't want to get you know lose the whole time that I have with you on, on American Beauty. Even though I would talk to you about American Beauty for a week straight because it's that good. Um, the the score, which actually Sam Mendes has worked with this incredible artist again and again. He did the the score for 1917 for Skyfall. Thomas Newman did the uh, the amazing score um, for for uh, for American Beauty. Um, and that one scene of the bag, and this is the, you know, this is, uh, you know, um, the most beautiful thing I've, I've videoed. His music on that is just astounding. And like, not to mention the entire score. Did you work with with Newman uh, during the production? Or is that something you saw after the post was already starting to sort of kick in? Well, I didn't work with him, um, but uh, with the... The initial, you know, as Sam was editing editing the movie, it was tempted with a lot of Tom Newman uh, previous stuff. Like there was a lot of Shawshank. Oh, interesting. There was a lot of Shawshank in there. Uh, I think there was some Meet Joe Black was in there. Um, so to sort of kind of set the paint, you know, set yeah. up the vibe. Yeah, and then uh, and then uh, once I heard this, you know, the the score, I was just like, well, that's amazing. Yeah. So, which actually a perfect, you know, Sam Mendes is kind of a perfect segue. Sam Mendes, as you said, was the director of Cabaret. And um, 
the uh, the main actor. God, I can't believe I just forgot. Uh, Alan Cummings mm -hmm. um, was was uh, the the main actor of Cabaret, and his understudy was a young graduate of NYU, uh, you know, theater school. Uh, you know, Michael C. Hall, um, who was the understudy to Alan Cummings during Cabaret. Um, and as as I've heard the myth, and God knows if this is true or not, but like my kind of my mythology is that when you were um, you get this amazing opportunity with HBO when HBO was was kind of uh, had just pretty much launched The Sopranos and had created this almost this new medium of this like high end television six feet under gets signed you're casting for that and Sam Mendes somehow recommends that you give Michael C. Hall a shot to read um, for David or for whichever characters you were casting uh, for Six Feet Under. Is that is that story true? Because that's always a story that I've had in my head. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, uh, it's okay. I, I went to, uh, I you know, we did a lot of casting here in, in Los Angeles and then I took a trip to New York and we did a lot of casting there and Michael just was came into that casting session. Oh, wow. And uh, I could, you know, um, and then later I found out that he was, uh, he was Alan Cummings understudy and he had also taken over the role after Alan Cummings left the show. Um, well, that's a much better story than mine, you know, and I've known Michael for years and I don't think I've ever actually drilled him on this thing, but, um, the fact that he didn't get the recommendation of Sam Mendes is even a stronger, you know, story because, you know, um, it's all on his talent. Yeah. It was all on his talent. Yeah. And then did, did, did Michael read for Nate and for David or was it always David? It was always David. Uh, Peter Krauser read for Nate and David. And then uh, what what was it about Michael that resonated in your mind? OK, this is the David that I'm imagining in my brain. Um, what he did in the audition, which is not necessarily who he is in real life, I could just he 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 somehow made the the there was a very palpable tension just in his his being mm. um that w was perfect for david because david is so uncomfortable in his own skin and he's so um you know at, at that point in the show in the beginning of the show he's struggling with so much shame and so much uh um fear and need to be secret about who he is. Sure. Um, and uh, he was able to, to sort of embody that in a way that was just nobody else came close. I mean, we had other guys that, you know, we look, we took two or three guys for each role into HBO, but um, the, the minute I saw him, I was like, that's the guy. And, Every time I hear you talking about uh, Six Feet Under, uh, I'm always um, very happy to hear that um, HBO was actually kind of hands off with you, right? Like, was it was it via the strength of American Beauty, or was it just a different time? Because you know, you always speak very fondly of that memory. That you know, you even have the one anecdote where um, after you showed them some initial work on the show, they, they actually come back to you and say, is there any way that you can make it, you know, more intense or more, you know, more crazy. Um, so asking you to actually push it even further rather than pull it back. Was that, it, it was, how, how did that feel? I mean, it, it just, it seems like that's just an incredible amount of, of, of fortune going from American beauty to that situation. Well, it was. It was great because I had had a meeting with Carolyn Strauss after she saw American Beauty and she said, I've always wanted to do a show about a family run funeral home. And something in my head just went click. I, 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 I can see that show because um, I'd spent some time in funeral homes when I was a kid because there was a period where a bunch of people died. Um, and uh, I was working on this sitcom for ABC at the time. Um, and I wasn't available. I said, good luck with that. I think that's such a great idea. I wish I could work on it, but I, I'm. This is post American beauty. You went back to television. Well, I had created a sitcom that got picked up and was premiering 
on ABC right around the same time American Beauty was premiering in theaters. Mm. Um, and uh, luckily for me, my sitcom got canceled uh, because I I really wasn't crazy about that format or working in that that world. Um, and so I went home for a Christmas holiday and uh, I was really depressed, even though I, in, in retrospect, I'm glad the show got canceled, but I was really depressed it got canceled. And uh, I thought, I'm just gonna write that funeral home show. And I did, and I wrote it on spec mm -hmm. and sent it to HBO and they liked it. Uh, and um, the note they actually had was the whole thing, we really like this, we really like the world, we really like the characters, it feels a little safe. Um, is there any way you could just make the whole thing a little bit more fucked up? <laughs> and I thought, That's when am I gonna get that note? Because I, yeah, was so, I was used to getting network notes on my sitcom, which basically could be condensed into two thoughts make everybody nicer and articulate the subtext sure both of which are horrible horrible things for drama you know what i mean yeah. um so i had to sort of unlearn a lot of what i had learned over the years uh second guessing how the higher ups were going to respond to material and respond to scripts and um hbo was pretty hands off. Um, and I'm sure that had something to do with the the um, success of American Beauty, the mm -hmm. critical and commercial success. I'm sure if it had not, if I didn't have that, there probably would have been a lot more um, notes. Uh, but somehow I had sort of proven myself with American Beauty. Uh, and also, it was a different time then. They were really yeah. looking. They were really looking for things that were unique and had a singular vision. And um, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. And I think that uh, I think that's changed. I think there are very few places now uh, in this sort of like uh, streaming glut that we have that uh that aren't very hands-on they uh you know i think i just think it's a different time yeah no I, and and it's also amazing for those people that don't know all the kind of behind the scenes of of the history of of this kind of high-end television that six feet under was this um almost like this incredible breeding ground for talent that would affect television for years to come because and correct me if I'm wrong here, but there was an executive producer or a producer who worked on the show named Bob Greenblatt. Yep. Um, and, and Bob Greenblatt um, eventually became the head of programming at Showtime and uh, really elevated Showtime to a, a level that I had never known before. And yep. after Bob left Showtime, he went to NBC and then NBC started doing shows like Hannibal and like, and then they, it started becoming this incredible thing. And and Six Feet Under is is really kind of where Bob sort of you know cut his teeth and became this powerful kind of television executive. Not to mention Michael Cuesta, who was a you know director on 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 Six Feet Under, and of course talent like Michael C. Hall and you know and yourself and, and stuff like that. So it, it's an incredibly important show. But um, again, a really rough death for the protagonist. Um, you know. Nate, Nate, when Nate passed away, it kind of hit me so hard because maybe what what you are, and I'm just thinking about this as we're talking, is that you're so good in making the protagonist feel like yourself, that the vulnerability of life and you know the reality that it's all gonna end one day, you kind of remind us of that, you know, with your work constantly. And that whole Nate stuff, I believe that was the very end of season five. Um, I'm still kind of traumatized over that, you know, <laughs> but, um, I read some, or I'm sorry, I heard in an interview that you actually had known that that was going to be Nate's, um, and that you had that for sure, that you knew that the show would end with Nate passing. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, it, it sort of felt like that's what it has to be. 
you know i mean this is a show about death being a part of life and this is a show about people who we pay to face death for us um i'm talking about you know the funeral industry or as they prefer to call themselves the, the death care industry <laughs> um i uh, I, it just seemed like that was the way that that just had to had to be the case. And then when we when the writers' room convened for season five and we started uh, pitching, um, we knew that it was the last season, so we had to come up with the way the show was going to end. Uh, somebody in the room, I wish I knew, I wish I could remember who it was because it wasn't me. Said we should just kill everybody, and there right. was a laugh. And then. They said, no, seriously, we should be with each character um, at the moment they die. And that was, you know, it was like, well, of course, what else could you do? Yeah. Um, the scene, and of course, that's such an incredible ending. I have a bittersweet, I'm just, look, I'll, I'll just be totally frank with you about that. I have a little bit of a bittersweet relationship with that ending, maybe because it is the ending. And, and like, I knew I wasn't going to watch anymore six feet under and it was so final right because it's like there is no more imagination about what happens to these characters will they ever come back will i see them again you see the end of all of them you know like every single one you know without mercy um to me the scene that i would rewind and watch again and rewind and watch again um is the scene of nate with the white suit um singing um oh god what what's the song Oh man, I can't remember right. Uh, now. Oh God, oh God, it's like he's just like it's such a powerful, like magical realism moment in the show. Um, yeah. Hesitate, I, oh God. Um. Anyway, he's singing a great old school song. Was that one of your scenes that 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 you had, like when you imagine that end of Nate coming? Um, was that always the way you pictured it? That it would be this kind of um, almost rock star performance when he gets to the other side? No, nope, I just, uh, I did write that episode and I directed that episode and I just, it just, it was, it just felt right. You know, my process is not particularly, um, it's very organic. It's very, I, I don't really consciously think things out so much as just sort of, it feels right for this. And, um, and that was where that came from. It's like, I don't want to burn up. Oh, God. What, uh, another day of, yeah, I'm a terrible singer. Not, oh, you know, I just want to celebrate. I just want to celebrate. Yeah, yeah. Another day of living. Yeah, it's so good, man. Thank you so much, Mr. Ball. That, I mean, that was just such good television. I always tell my friends that Six Feet Under is the war and peace of television. You know? <laughs> you know, like, wow. if you really, If you really want to take yourself through the range of emotions of the human condition, you will sit down and watch Six Feet Under because it's like for a television show where the high concept is, is that the opening, the cold open to every episode is somebody's death. I mean, that that's, you know, I can't, first of all, I can't believe you got that show made and thank God that you got that show made. Mm. You know, like, like you got to, in some ways, maybe thank David Chase and The Sopranos. Absolutely. Uh, you know, like ha having elevated it and said, well, wait a minute, you know, this is the perfect timing for something strange because man, that's a tough, that's a tough sell. Mm. So now your next magnum opus, you know, and it's just, it's incredible. You're like the Michael Jordan of like magnum opuses. And the <laughs> next one, um, you, you take a series of books called um, the Sookie Stackhouse um, Diaries, I believe they're called, or they're, the, the series of books is the Suki Stackhouse something. Um, and you convert these books um, into the show True Blood, which when I was working on, on Dexter back in the old days, um, and we would go to Comic-Con, you know, we were all very proud because Dexter was a, you know, was a big deal. But, you know, it didn't take long for True Blood to be the biggest thing in pop culture, you know, like in terms of that kind of nerd, you know, like that kind of geek fandom thing. Basically what, and the MCU is today. True Blood was back in two thousand, you know, six, two thousand seven, which is you know quite quite astounding, you know, mm -hmm. for you to take that ride from American Beauty to Six Feet Under 
and then boom, True Blood. How did the whole Sookie Stackhouse stuff come about? I was late. I was early for a dentist appointment and I was wasting time in Barnes and Noble. And I picked up this book um, that said, uh, I think it was called Dead Until Dark which is the title of the first book. But uh, the tagline was maybe having a vampire for a boyfriend wasn't such a great idea. <laughs> and that made me laugh. And so I bought it and uh, I read it. And, uh, and uh, there were four other books in the series at that time. Uh, she eventually wrote, I think, 13. Char Charlemagne um, Harris was, is her name, correct? Charlene. Charlene. Charlene Harris. I'm sorry, Charlene Harris. Yeah. And... I uh, um, I read it and it it was wildly entertaining and fun and so different from Six Feet Under, and uh, I guess I just felt like I was ready to do something that was a little more um, popcorn mm. and not quite. You know, I felt like you know five years of Six Feet Under, I had been staring into the abyss. <laughs> Uh, Thank I, you for that. Thank you for putting yourself through that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to do something uh, different. Um, and uh, so I had my agent call and the books were available to be optioned and I optioned them and I wrote a script and gave it to uh, HBO and they were like, well, we already have a vampire show in development. And I said, oh, OK, well thanks, you know, I'll shop this around. And um, they got very upset and said, no, you can't do that. Uh, and they ended up actually pulling the plug on that other show, which uh, I feel, I've feel i always felt sort of guilty about. Is it uh, is it some kind of interview with a vampire type of spinoff thing or? No, I think it was like a family of vampires. It was like the Sopranos, but instead of mobsters, <laughs> they were vampires. <laughs> Oh, um, sorry. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> yeah. um, but then, uh, you know, we shot a pilot and uh, such a good pilot, too. We shot the pilot and we gave it to him and they they it took him like a couple of months to decide to. Is it, is it the same pilot that we all saw? Was that the pilot that. Yes, it's the same pilot that everybody saw, but there was one one role was recast. Um, can you say which one, or is it a secret? Uh, um, it was Tara. Uh, oh, okay. Tara was, Tara was really bad. Well, um, you ended up with the right Tara, that's for sure. You yeah, know? I think so, too. Yeah, yeah, um, she was incredible. Uh, and uh, so I thought, okay, well, this isn't going to happen, so what am I going to do next? And then out of the blue, I got a phone call saying we're going to series. And, and how did you how did you bring um, Anna Paquin? Because I remember that in another interview, you've said that HBO had kind of wanted you to to use uh, known quantities as Hollywood uh, of Hollywood talent in Six Feet Under, and you kind of chose against it, um, and you kind of you know cast it very organically. And then now in, in in True Blood, you bring in somebody who at the time I think is, was extremely popular as a mainstream Hollywood actor uh, with Anna Paquin working on X Men, being nominated for an Academy Award for The Piano, like. She was a known quantity. Um, how did you cast her in the lead role? She pursued it. Mm. She, uh, she, she, from day one, she pursued it. She came in and she read like four times. Um, and, you know, I th it's not that they want to, that at, at that point at least, they weren't necessarily interested in filling the show with, with known quantities because... Part, that was part of what was so great about The Sopranos. Sure. Um, I mean, for The Sopranos, the known quantity was Lorraine Bracco because she had been exactly. in Goodfellas. And right. for Six Feet Under, the known quantity was Rachel Griffiths because she had been nominated for an Oscar for Hillary and Jackie. Right. Um, but Anna pursued it. Uh, and, she, you know, and uh, ultimately it was like, well, she's she's the right one for the role. Yeah, the 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 other thing that's first of all, that intro song, um, my band and I used to cover that song all the time because it's like we we would never play it out, but when we were like we're like like just us in the studio, 
Yeah. He would always play that track. I mean, that is one of the great, like, it's just a great track. You got to tell me, how did you stumble into that track? Was that like a music supervisor that recommended it? Or was it something that you had in your mind? Actually, it's something that I had in my mind. Oh, wow. I, I put together playlists when I write. When Same. I, and, um, and so I put together a playlist of a lot of, you know, alt country and rockabilly and uh, stuff like that. And that one just felt, felt uh, perfect. Um, hold on, just sorry. No problem. Take your time. Take your time. Um, that one was just perfect. And, and, uh, and when we, when it came time to put together a title sequence, I said, can we build a title sequence around this song? Oh man. And, um, Chills again, Mr. Bo <laughs> that, that was such an incredible, it's like typically when you watch a show and now even Netflix has introduced the skip intro feature, right? Like the, yeah. we're in the culture of skip intro. And um, that that one track, you were almost, you know, that was almost good enough to watch, you know, to like tune in, was just to see that one th track play out. Um, another thing about True Blood that blew my mind, and actually during the peak pandemic, when just before I left West Hollywood, I rewatched the entire series just, you know, randomly. And the one thing that also jumps out about that show is how incredible the cinematography is on that show. And, yeah. and, and even in that opening episode, that the opening scene inside the quick mart with that, you know, like that halogen weird, like fluorescent lighting and how it just sets the tone for the entire six. You guys were six seasons of that bad boy, right? I think it was seven, seven seasons. Yeah. It, it just, but it never lost the beauty of that, sort of pace that that opening shot in that quick mart sets up. Was that, um, to be honest with you, I've even tried to hire cinematographers um, that work on True Blood just so I can try to replicate that vibe. Was was that was that something that you had like a specific person kind of making sure that that consistency was there for the look of the show for all the seasons that it went? Well, we worked with a lot of different uh, um, cinematographers uh, but, uh, Checo Varese was the guy who shot the pilot and he did not work on the show. Um, but Romeo Tyrone and, uh, oh, what's his name? Matt. He's, he went on, he's, he's a huge cinematographer now. He shot Wonder Woman. Uh, oh. I can't remember his name. Uh, I mean, I, I tend to let the cinematographers be in charge of, keeping the look of the show um similar you know but keep. but it's so consistent from episode to episode you know mm -hmm. like like that's the thing that like as somebody who's tried or dabbled in television and i've worked in television before like as as the showrunner as the as the ringleader mm -hmm. how, how do you maintain that level of consistency on the look it, it, it doesn't seem like it's a trivial thing or or or, or an easy thing to do you just hire the right people. Right. You know? And right. If, you, if you see something going astray, you speak up. Right. But my, sometimes harder said, you know, easier said than done. My approach has always been hire the best people for the job and then get out of their way. Right? <laughs> you know, and then if you see something going off, you step in and you go like, let's talk about this. But uh, when you run a show, for me at least, there's so much energy and effort that just has to go into the writing and keeping sure. the scripts and keeping the scripts coming and keeping them good uh that i can i i you know i i i tend to um uh allow the cinematographers to to do their job to be in charge of i mean you you work a lot with somebody on the pilot and you mm -hmm. talk about it and you talk about the look you want and you talk about the lighting and how you want everything to feel. Uh, but once you get into running the show, um, it's pretty much letting them do their thing. And, and look, you've been so generous with your time. We're already at 50 minutes. Typically I try to keep these under an hour. The, the last thing that I'd love to sort of pick your brain on is exactly what you're talking about now, which is this, 
art of running the writer's room. You know, you've done it twice. Well, you've done it four times um, that I'm aware of at an extremely high level. You know, even Banshee gave birth to Anthony Starr, which I think is one of the most, you know, incredible up and coming, you know, talents out there. You know, like he, he that he is a special, you know, talent. Um, how, what's your philosophy methodology for running a writer's room? Like, I, I, I'd love to get a little insight on that. Well, first of all, when I read people's, uh, back when I was starting out, uh, everybody wrote spec scripts of existing shows. Hmm. Um, and I hired somebody who wrote a really great episode of The Sopranos. And then I had to let him go because he just because he could write a good Sopranos doesn't mean that he could write a good Six Feet Under. Interesting. Um, so I start. So that's when I started. I only read original work. Um, I only read, uh, you know, pilots or film scripts or things because I want to get a sense of the writer's voice. I don't need to know if they can replicate my voice. I need to know that they're that their voice is very similar to mine already. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then of course I try to keep a lot of, I, I, I try to make sure that there are, it, it's a balance in the room of male and female. Mm, uh, that's, that's very interesting. You know? Um, and you're uh, very I, conscious about that, I, about making sure that that tension of, of both sides of the spectrum are, are kind of, represented yeah and i also you know for six feet under uh i liked having some older people in the room because of ruth and uh of course um and younger people and then once we got into like here and now i really really wanted to have a room that was very diverse in terms of different people from dif different ethnic backgrounds uh because I, I don't know what it's like. I can I can hypothesize what it's like to be sure. African American or or to be Asian, but I'm a white guy, and that's all I know. Right. And um, so now, when I'm putting together a room, I just look at the show and and think and read people's original work, and then it's also a lot is based on an interview and a person's energy. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't like crazy writer rooms. Uh, <laughs> I like for people to be passionate and to be willing to argue, but I also like for uh, for everybody to be on the same page in terms of wanting to make the best show possible and not uh, not have it be about ego or or what? That, that kind of thing. What What are the hallmarks of a crazy crazy writer room? Like when you see like the initial, you know, symptoms, like, like what are the typical warning signs of a crazy writer room? Well, a lot of times, uh, if you have a showrunner who is abusive, mm. um, that's crazy. Uh, if there's a lack of respect in terms of, because, you know, people are pitching ideas and they're getting shot down and there's a way to do that without making somebody feel bad because they came up with a bad idea. Oh, that's a good lesson. Um, so, because you got to be able to come up with dumbass ideas before you come up with, you know, you got to be feel free to pitch whatever comes into your head right, without right. fearing that people are going to make fun of you. Sure. Um, I think sometimes, you know, sometimes there are personality conflicts where somebody just doesn't like another person, and um, you have to keep an eye on that, and you know. Yeah. Um, if necessary, like, you know, call people into your office and say, like, I know that, that, you know, I know that, that there's some animosity between you two, but you both need to deal with it. Yeah. It, and, it reminds me of, um, of the scene that, um, every time I see this scene, I'm like, okay, that's, that's Michael C. Hall right there. And it's a scene, I forget if it's the first or second episode of, of the first season of Six Feet Under, where he's confronting the guy who wants to buy the funeral uh, parlor from the Fishers. Mm -hmm. And he sits him down. And you think up to that point, you've only seen David as this kind of shy, kind of closed off, 
very reserved person. But when he sits them down, he really confronts them. And he really scolds them, you mm-hmm. know, and like this, like this, this animal comes from inside of him and, and, and loses it. Is that you? Do you get like that? Are you a good scolder when, when, when somebody messes with your ship? Um, I've lost my temper a couple of times when I, <laughs> right. for example, there was, uh, there, there was someone who worked on the show who was, um who, who was uh taking prop furniture and oh boy and furnishing his apartment with it oh boy and uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah anytime something like that happens I, I i i lost my temper when some weird guy came into my office and said are are you alan ball and i said yeah and he came over and started hugging me yeah. and i was i i he was an actor who wanted to be on the show and I, I lost my temper then, but for the most part, I don't lose my temper. I enjoy the work so much that I'm in that when I'm working, I'm in a pretty good place emotionally and, and mentally because it's fun. If you do it right, it's oh, fun. Man, it's, it's the most fun. You know, I've, yeah. I've, I've written some stuff in my day, uh, mostly video games um, in terms of published, you know, work. Um, you know, some, you know, some stuff and it's, it, it's such a fun process and I'll, I'll end it with this back there. I can't help it, but see that you have a bunch of index cards. Is that some Allen ball masterpiece under construction? That's uh stuff that I was doing for, um, I've got a, I've got something in development at stars and that was, those were me organizing my thoughts and scenes to put together for a series Bible. And going. is that a healthy thing for you? Like in terms of giving advice to up and coming writers, even myself who, you know, I'm an old man, but I've been doing this for such a long time. And that process of, of creating, it's, it's always like you start brand new every time you start a new project and like, I'm going to try this new method. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, learn the, the fallacy of the antecedent and apply that here. I'm going to look at Plato and, and apply that here. You, you, you're always looking for that, truth to bring into your work is that your process you like to put things down in index cards and place them on a table and see them and like be able to stand back and look at them it's different my process is different uh with every project interesting uh this is the first time i had to i've had to create a bible that uh you know that goes into what the show is about why it's important blah 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 what you know here's the historical uh things that we're uh, addressing here's a breakdown of all the characters here's a breakdown of 10 episodes i've never had to do that before because uh all the shows i did before i just created i just wrote a spec a spec script sure and it, it went to series yeah. um, so a lot of this index card is not something that i usually do but there was such a massive amount of information that had to be uh um, consolidated uh, that I just resorted to index cards. And um, since most of your, you know, we just saw Dexter New Blood, which I thought was incredible. And, and I'm so proud of Michael for, for the job he did on that. I think, you know, you could tell that he put his love up there on the screen, you know, for that one. Um and, you know, sadly, most of your incredible characters are already, you know, you know, not to be disrespectful, but, you know, dead and buried. Um, is there any chance of down the line maybe seeing a, you know, true blood type thing coming back? Or is that? There are, there's both a, in this day and age where anything that was ever successful has to be completely, <laughs> you know, um, exploited until uh, Sure. Because there's a chance that money might be made. There is actually a True Blood, I don't want to call it a reboot, but a sort of a spinoff in development at HBO. And there okay. is actually a Six Feet Under. Uh, oh, wow. That would uh, at HBO. I'm involved in both of them in name only. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, just, no, it's it, it was my choice. Um uh, because I just feel like I've been there, done that. Sure. Um, but at and, the same time, you 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 kind of don't mind a new generation taking a stab 
at the groundwork that you laid out. No, and I'm, I mean, I, I, I certainly will. It's not that I'm not involved at all, but it's sure. I'm, I'm not the driving force, and that's fine because I've got you know I want to do something new. Well, first of all, I cannot wait, you know, and um, to um, to to see what you come up with next. I'm going to give my own uh, homework assignment to myself, and I'm going to watch here and now because I haven't seen it yet. I, I'm not going to front, as the kids say, and say that I've seen it because I haven't. But I will definitely be watching that, and I have to finish Banshee. So I, there's already work that you've created that I haven't watched. So I'm already <laughs> feeling very lucky about that. Um, but Mr. Ball, thank you so much for your time, for your generous, um, you know, uh, time of giving it to me without knowing who I am, talking to some ape with a cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> I can't, I, uh, I can't believe this is, you know, this happened and I'm very grateful for it. So I'm going to end the podcast here. This is Mr. Alan Ball. He has so much incredible work out there. If you love movies and you haven't seen American Beauty, um, watch it tonight because it is literally one of the few perfect films ever written. It's a masterclass on every level. Six Feet Under, like I said, the war and peace of television. And True Blood is probably one of the most addicting, fun television shows that I've ever watched, you know. And I've seen it, I think, three times the whole way through. Wow. And it's, you know, and it's just, it's just a lot of fun, you know. And maybe making it because, like, I've worked on incredible things. Like I worked on the game. I, I co-wrote the game Grand Theft Auto Vice City. It's one of the biggest games ever made. Mm -hmm. I've never really been able to play it, you know, myself, you know. So like I have this very strange relationship with it, you know. Um, I can maybe assume that that's a little bit, you know, like you, like you gave birth to all these things. But thank you so much for all that, sir. Thank you very oh, much. Mr. Thank you so much for saying such kind things. Oh, it's, it's, um, I can keep going on forever. You know? <laughs> so I'm going to stop it there. Thank you all and have a nice uh, day and we will see you again soon. Thank you.